So welcome everyone. Always getting used to the technology of Zoom and Facebook and whatnot. But welcome to our Bird Book Club. We had a little break over the holidays, but we're excited to be back now. I'm Susan Bonfield. I'm the Director of Environment for the Americas. And this is one of those programs we started because of the pandemic and our desire to keep in touch with you. Uh, we're an international organization. We work across the Americas, from Argentina to Canada to the Caribbean. And these are some of the members of our team located here. I'm on the top left, Miguel top center is from Venezuela, Shelda top right is in Puerto Rico, Daniela going below me is from Mexico, Barbara is here in our office in Colorado but originally from Brazil, Chuyu from Taiwan is also in our Boulder office, Guido Berguido from Panama, Shalina from Panama and Daisy DeBell originally from France but also here in our Boulder Colorado office. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. We're really looking forward to having you and, for, and to having you meet our team as well. We're known for our coordination of World Migratory Bird Day. This is a global celebration of migratory birds and their conservation. And it's this international team that makes it possible. They do an amazing job uh, promoting the conservation of migratory birds and raising awareness in communities. It's the world's largest migratory bird festival. And we coordinate it in partnership with the Convention on Migratory Species in Bonn, Germany, and the Agreement on the Conservation of African Eurasian Migratory, uh, migratory Water Birds. We coordinate the program in the Americas, but collaborate around the world. Just a few of our programs, of course, because of uh, the new situation this year, we've had to do a lot virtually. And I have to say, our team has done a fantastic job. Not only do we have this bird book club, but we also have virtual bird camps for young people ages four to 12. And we've started all sorts of other programming, working with public schools and um, hosting World Migratory Bird Day events live and virtually on the internet. So we've done quite a bit uh, to keep things happening. We do this in a variety of ways and we do this by reaching out um, to, let's see, hang on a second. I have a message that perhaps I've shared to the wrong page. So I'm gonna make sure I stop that live stream. Um, we worked, uh, we take our, our materials across the Americas. We present materials to our partners. Um, we also work on research in different areas and we're very active on social media. So if you haven't followed us, please do so. We develop a variety of education materials in multiple languages. And we also run um, diversity internship programs, reaching out to underrepresented audiences to bring them to the nature and the sciences. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization, so we always appreciate donations and contributions. We also have a shop which Daisy runs, who you met earlier. And it's through this shop that we also raise funds that support our program. Um, again, we've been hosting World Migratory Bird Day live events since uh, some groups can't, can't join in person. Uh, these are 24 to 48 hour events with presentations from partners across the Americas and indeed across the around the world, uh, bringing youth together in youth forums, bringing together experts on birds and bird migration and bird conservation. So I invite you to join us. I'm sure we'll have more virtual events coming up this May on our official day of May 8th and hope that you'll be able to join us then if you can't go to an event live and in person. So please stay in touch with us. We have a lot going on. We have a newsletter that comes out every week and we're very active and love communicating with our partners. This event tonight is generously contributed by Penguins International. And so Katie, I'm gonna let you come on and talk about your programs with Penguins International. Thank you so much for your support of tonight's session and for joining us. Thank you so much for the introduction. I'm so thrilled to be here. My name is Katie Prop, and I am the Conservation Education Manager at Penguins International. For those of you who may not have heard about us, we are a Denver nonprofit that is dedicated to global penguin conservation. And our organization was created in 2017 to respond to gaps 
in penguin conservation. So we, we respond to those gaps by advancing knowledge and understanding of penguins through scientific research. We promote awareness of the threats that penguins face, and we also provide conservation education to the public. Next slide, please. This is just a quick snapshot of some of the many programs that we run. Um, currently, we are working in partnership with the Punta San Juan program in Peru to develop and deploy artificial nest boxes for Humboldt penguins. We also have been developing many digital resources. As you know, during these pandemic times, digital resources are super helpful. Um, so we created several different uh, education programs for youth, as well as like a free downloadable penguin workbook that's on our website. And then our penguin pollution exposure study is in its completion phase. So we're really excited that we have all of our data collected on Gen 2 penguins and mercury. Um, and it's been analyzed and now the papers are awaiting publication. So lots of projects, lots of moving parts, but we're really excited about the work that we do. Next slide, please. We are thrilled to sponsor tonight's event and support Environment for the Americas, as well as fellow penguin enthusiast Diane's presentation. If you love penguins as much as we do, I'd love for you to join our penguin community. And you can do that by following us on social media and signing up for our newsletter on our webpage. So we can be found at www.penguinsinternational.org. Thanks for your time. Thank you so much, Katie. I can just imagine that you, you can get everybody into penguins. I, I really appreciate that introduction. And again, we appreciate your sponsorship. Diane, we're ready to bring you on now, the, the hero of the, of the session tonight. So if you could turn your camera back on. Okay. And have, yes. Thanks. So Diane, I wanna welcome you and we're so excited to hear about your work and your book, The Great Penguin Rescue. And I wanted to introduce you by just asking you to say a few words about yourself and your background and your history and how you got into penguins before you share your presentation. Oh my goodness. So I live in Massachusetts. I was raised near the ocean and have always felt a very deep connection with the ocean and have always loved animals. And, uh, and so I eventually, I sort of always had this dream of working with wildlife, but put that dream in the back of my mind because it didn't seem possible. And when I was in my mid thirties, I went back to college for a second degree in animal science. And so I was studying veterinary nursing. And so I had an internship at the New England Aquarium in Boston. And that was my first introduction really to penguins. And three years after I was hired there is when this oil spill took place in South Africa that my book is about and that I'm gonna be talking with you about today. Wow, that's great. So I'm gonna let you share your presentation now. Okay. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna mute myself for just a minute. And I think you can go on and put your presentation up. All right, let me see if I can. All right, are you guys seeing my? Yes. Yes, okay, good. And I think you can turn it into, there you go. There we go. Okay, I'm just gonna move this box here. Okay, so I did put together um, a brief slideshow for you guys tonight. I, I don't know how many of you have read the book or are reading the book or will read the book. Um, so I don't wanna give away everything, but I do wanna give you an overview. Uh, and so this is just my contact information. If anybody has any questions, comments, concerns, and you wanna reach out to me, my email is Diane, spelled D-Y-A-N, at thepenguinlady.com. And my website is thepenguinlady.com. Oops, hang on, I get the right, here we go. Uh, and so I'm also excited for this because I just saw in the, as we were getting ready to come on, that someone that I worked with during the Great Penguin Rescue in South Africa 20 years ago is here. Um, and so I hope you don't mind me calling you out, Linda Elliott, who um, she is, has the Hawaii Wildlife Center now is what she does. But at the time she was with IBRRC, which is a California based group that Basically, they're the people that would respond and they still do. They're now, they now go by IBR whenever there's a, an oil spill anywhere around the world and particularly when birds are involved. Um, so 
The Great Penguin Rescue, saving 40,000 penguins from an oil spill. I will say this happened 20 years ago, almost 21 years ago. And it was definitely the, the most impactful experience of my life, the most grueling thing I've ever done, but by far the most rewarding. Um, and as I just said, I grew up near the ocean. I always loved animals. And at the age of 10 or so, I first learned about endangered species and was really traumatized to learn that every day there were animals being wiped off the face of the earth and didn't, you know, I wanted to help. I wanted to do something to protect them, but I had no idea how one person could possibly make a difference. So it would take 30 years before I would actually get the answer to that question. And so, as I said, I worked at the New England Aquarium in Boston, and this is me uh, with the first penguin I ever raised there. I was there as an intern, and then after graduating, I was hired, and I was there for nine years as a, I was a senior penguin aquarist. And that's me with Sand Cobb, who was the first penguin chick I ever raised. He's an adult there, but he was a little ball of fluff when I first met him. And he's actually named after the rescue center in Cape Town that has been doing this work since 1968. They are named Sand Cobb, and that's how he was named. And so this photo was actually taken shortly after this rescue effort. We were actually in the middle of our own breeding season at the New England Aquarium when the treasure oil spill took place. And this is my coworker and friend Mandy and I weighing penguin chicks that were, had just been born that summer in our exhibit. And this is the counterpart, their counterpart in the wild. So on the left, you see some adult African penguins. And on the right, these little brown balls of fluff are older African penguin chicks. And these are the penguins that were impacted by this oil spill. So they are the only penguin found on the African, African continent. Um, that orange line shows their foraging range where they get their food and the red dots are their breeding colonies. And so they are found in Namibia and South Africa. And so what happened? So on June 23rd of 2000, this ship ironically named the Treasure sank off the coast of Cape Town and it spilled about 1300 tons of fuel oil and diesel and when it did it polluted the habitat of nearly half the entire world population of African penguins. So she sank just outside of Table Bay which is a shipping route where all these big ships come in and so they do have a lot of oil spills in this region because of the location. And so the treasure sank right there where the red dot is, just north of Robben Island, which at the time was home to about 18,000 African penguins, and just south of Dassin Island, which at the time had about 50,000 African penguins. Now at the time of this oil spill, the world population of African penguins was about 165,000 birds. And when the treasure sank, it was actually the height of the breeding season, and it was actually the best breeding season that scientists had ever recorded for the African penguins. So really the timing and the location of this ship sinking could not have been worse. And within hours, oiled penguins, heavily oiled penguins were coming up onto the shores of the islands. And so Sand Cub immediately launched this rescue effort. And before long, 20,000 African penguins covered with oil were rescued. Now the call for help, uh, Estelle Vandermeer at the time was the director at Sand Cub, and so she immediately called experts around the world. So she called Jay Holcomb and Linda, who was also with IBR at that time. Um, she called IFA, who sort of oversaw the logistics, and she also started calling zoos and aquariums around the world, calling for penguin experts to come help them. Uh, and so about 110 of us that were from zoos and aquariums came in staggered shifts throughout the three months of this rescue effort. And this was, I was a member of the first team of penguin experts from the US to come from zoos and aquariums. There were eight of us. And this was us at the hotel, I think about midnight, we'd just been on a plane for 27 hours. And I think this is the last photo you'll see of us smiling for the next few weeks. Um, and so the rescue centers. So Sand Cobb itself is a pretty small rescue center. They, at the time, were designed to hold a maximum of two or 3,000 penguins. Uh, but within three days of the, this treasure sinking, they were bursting at the seams with over 5,000 oiled birds. And they knew they needed another facility. And so they located a train repair warehouse in downtown Cape Town, this circled area is where those buildings are, and this is called Salt River. And so in three days time, 
basically from the ground up, all they had was this building with basically nothing in it. They built a fully functioning animal hospital, essentially a rescue center. And so this is that outside the entrance to that rescue center, it was called the Salt River Rescue Center. And when this was our first view, essentially, when we pulled up in a minibus that first morning at about 6.30 or seven o'clock. And I just wanted to read you a page from the book that sort of describes this moment and what it was like, because it was a little overwhelming. I had not yet been lucky enough to visit a penguin colony in the wild, but having read that these sprawling seabird gatherings can be heard and smelled long before they can be seen, I fully expected to be greeted by a cacophony of braying and honking upon entering the rescue center. After working with African penguins for several years at the New England Aquarium, I knew firsthand that they were indeed very vocal birds, prone to extended fits of raucous competitive braying during territorial displays and pair bonding rituals. Because their calls are remarkably similar to the braying sounds made by donkeys, African penguins are sometimes called jackass penguins, or in South Africa, beach donkeys. But instead of hearing their harsh brays as we stepped through the cavernous doors of the warehouse and into the shadowy interior, we were met with an eerie silence, immediately signaling to us in undeniable terms the stressed mental and physical state of the penguins inside. In a space that should have been reverberating with the boisterous calls of thousands of penguins, the air was heavy and still. The silence itself was like an unearthly presence filling the building. I stood rooted in place, trying to detect any of the usual sounds that should have been flooding the space. The clamor of penguins honking and braying, fighting over territory, and displaying for or calling to a mate. It was the middle of their breeding season, but in the chaos of removing the penguins from the islands, thousands of mated pairs had been abruptly separated from each other. Every one of these penguins had been rudely ripped from their nests, their mates, and their chicks, then tossed haphazardly into random holding pens in the vast warehouse. Standing there, just inside the entrance, I kept waiting to hear the plaintive voices of displaced and lonesome penguins calling out, trying to locate their mates. But the traumatized birds remained mute. And so I don't know if that gives you some sense of, of what it felt like to enter this massive rescue center filled with 16,000 penguins covered with black oil. Um, and this is one of the only pictures, this is the members of my team about an hour after entering that building where we're sort of being given the tour and shown how things are run. Uh, and, and we all look pretty shell-shocked as well. And so the volunteers. Now, you used the word hero at the top of this, Susan, and I have to say, I think it was before we started officially, but the volunteers are the heroes of this story, certainly. Um, over the course of this rescue, a thousand volunteers a day on average were inside of this building, this massive rescue center. They, they showed up in droves and over the course of the three months, 12 and a half thousand extraordinary volunteers showed us up to help us. And the amazing thing is that these people didn't have any experience doing this. This was not their job at all in any way, shape or form. And so they did not have to be there, yet they were. And so for those of us who were there in a professional capacity, this incredible human response to these animals in crisis was overwhelming and awe-inspiring. And anytime the press would ask us about the volunteers, we'd get about a sentence out and then just burst into tears and couldn't talk anymore because we were so overwhelmed by them. And this, these were some of the volunteers that were in our room every single day. That's Irwin, Isabella, Jay, and Dennis, who were there every day without fail. And here they are force feeding penguins, which is a really grueling, difficult, stressful thing to do. And Irwin always had a smile on his face. I don't know why, but God bless him. And, and you might notice too that they're wearing these very thick gloves, rubber and neoprene gloves. What I haven't mentioned yet about African penguins is that they have razor sharp beaks. And so before long, our entire bodies looked like this, head to toe, literally covered with penguin bites. Um, and so I have a lot of scars from this rescue, but I, I wear them proudly. They don't bother me one little bit. 
And so I wanted to just sort of highlight a couple of these incredible volunteers. Uh, in this photo is Dee Dee Edish on the left and Big Mike, Mike Herbig on the right. So if you have read the book, you probably recognize these, these names. Um, and so Dee Dee, uh, they both actually showed up on the first day of this whole disaster. So as soon as the calls went out for help, they showed up at Sand Cobb. And as soon as this Salt River Rescue Center had to be built, they went over there and started building. They started construction work. And then they both stuck around. And Big Mike essentially became the volunteer coordinator. He is a jujitsu champion in Cape Town. He is the largest human I've ever stood next to at six foot 10 and 275, 70 pounds of solid muscle. Um, and he just sort of started doing what comes naturally to him, which is to organize people. And so eventually IFA hired him to stay till the very end of the rescue in that capacity. Um, and then Dee Dee on the left, she again showed up in the beginning and she proved to be so reliable and dependable and mature and capable that they actually put her in charge of a section of one of those giant rooms inside of the rescue center. And it was only six weeks into the rescue when she collapsed one day from exhaustion and dehydration and was sent to the hospital that we learned she didn't actually meet the minimum age requirement. We had a requirement that the volunteers all be a minimum of 16 years old. And it was then that we discovered Dee Dee was only 14, which was astonishing. Like no one would have ever guessed this. And, and, and regrettably, they couldn't let her back in uh, to the rescue center afterwards to help anymore, which she was really crushed about that. Uh, but she was amazing. So the day after we arrived in Cape Town, we arrived exactly a week after the ship sank. Um, the day afterwards, all of a sudden, this new crisis began to unfold. The, the oil was now moving north towards Dassin Island, where these other tens of thousands of penguins are, and it was about to hit. And they knew if it did, there'd be no more room in the rescue center, not enough volunteers to take care of more birds. And we were already starting to have a problem getting enough fish for the penguins we had, so there wouldn't be enough food. So what do we do? So all the rescue directors got together and, and Rob Crawford, I think it was, who was one of the researchers down there, threw out this crazy idea. He said, well, what if we collect the birds at greatest risk of getting oiled and we ship them up the coast 500 miles away and release them into the clean waters there by Port Elizabeth because we know there's a foraging ground there because there's a St. Croix breeding island there and we'll let them swim home and we know they'll do that and we think it'll take about two to three weeks and we'll cross our fingers and hope that the oil is cleaned up by the time they get there. It was a huge gamble. They didn't know if it would work but but thankfully the day that first penguin got back was the same day that the oil was cleaned up from the environment. So it was a gamble that paid off. So of course, all of these 20,000 penguins covered with oil have to be washed. And so I won't go into all the details, but oil and penguins is bad, <laughs> they don't mix. It interferes with their ability to waterproof their feathers and it, they swallow it when they are preening themselves, trying to get it off and that's toxic. So you've got to get the oil off of them pretty quickly. And so to do that, you, you bathe them in hot soapy water, essentially. And it would take two people at least an hour to clean one penguin. And you would hold them in these tubs of hot soapy water and agitate that through their feathers until the water ran black and then put them into a clean tub and again and again and again until the water ran clear so that you knew all that oil was now gone from underneath their feathers and using a toothbrush for the delicate areas. So this is a very delicate procedure, takes a lot of time. Um, and this brings me to my favorite story from the Treasure Rescue, which is about uh, a young man named Louis Koch. So before you actually do the bathing part in the hot soapy water, you spray the penguins with a degreaser. And essentially a degreaser is a lighter oil, it's like a canola oil or a safflower oil. And, you, and what that will do, you spray it on them, you let them sort of marinate for a while, and that lighter oil starts to soften that thicker, uh, denser bunker oil, and then you can wash them. So this 17 year old student had invented a degreaser about two years prior to the treasure oil spill. And we actually were using it at the sand cob facility throughout this rescue. So I think it's incredible and so cool that these teenagers did so much to help save these penguins. And so the outcome, uh, 
the big picture is that of those 40,000 penguins that were rescued, 95% of them were successfully released back into the wild again, which is basically a miracle. Uh, and it could not have happened without those 12 and a half thousand extraordinary volunteers because 110 or 150 of us never could have saved all those birds on our own. Um, and we know through long-term monitoring that these penguins have bred nearly as successfully as their never oil counterparts, and they've lived just as long. So it really underscores the validity of getting out there and rescuing these animals when they are caught in an oil spill. Um, and so this is, again, a picture from that release. And so uh, this quote I love because to me, this really sort of encapsulates what the treasure rescue was about. It is this, individually, we are one drop, together, we are an ocean. So individually, you know, one of us couldn't have saved them, but we all came together, 12 and a half thousand people worked together as one and basically saved a species. So it just was uh, an extraordinary experience um, and really sort of catalyzed my desire to do everything I can to help protect uh, penguins. And so since this rescue, we've, we've, the population has crashed quite a bit. There's only about 15,000 pair left now, not because of this oil spill, but because of starvation. The top two threats to most penguin species today, including the African penguin, are global warming and overfishing. And these both impact their ability to get out of food. So starvation is the, the main problem for so many penguins. And so my mission statement is to raise awareness and funding to protect threatened and endangered penguins. So I donate 20% of the proceeds from my books and from every appearance to penguin conservation groups. And so if you would like to help support St. Cobb in their efforts, uh, they have a chick bolstering program and every year they are, they are rescuing oiled penguins because of that location. As I said, it's a shipping route. So every year, even when there's not a ship sinking or a major oil spill, they still are rescuing about 1500 penguins that get oiled in these little minor spills out at sea. Um, and so SANCOB is S-A-N-C-C-O-B dot C-O dot Z-A, that SANCOB dot C-O dot Z-A is their website. And you can go there to support them if you would like to. Um, and also you can find them through my website, thepenguinlady.com. So if you go to the, um, it's, it's covered right now, but the help penguins and the donate right there, that will bring you to a page with not just SANCOB, but all the different penguin rescue research and conservation centers throughout the Southern Hemisphere. So if you love Little Blues, you can find a Little Blue Center to support whatever it is you would like to do. Um, I know they all could use your support and would appreciate your support. Um, if you would like to share this story, the, the brief, there's a 12 minute TED talk, also called the, 12, the Great Penguin Rescue on TED. Um, which now has had almost half a million views. So it's really humbling to know that a lot of people have heard this story now throughout the world because it's an, an important story to share. And then my book uh, from Simon & Schuster's Free Press came out, what is that, 10 years ago now. And it's also in Portuguese. So if you know any Portuguese speakers who would like to read this story, um, Zahar Publishing put it out uh, in 2011. And then just a month ago, my first children's book came out all about penguins. And this is uh, beautifully illustrated by Ray Shul, just a uh, basic penguin biology and behavior for four to eight year olds. And so uh, again, part of my proceeds from all these goes to penguin conservation. And again, my website is thepenguinlady.com and email diane at thepenguinlady.com if you would like to reach out to me. And I'm on social media as the penguin lady. And I wanna thank Environment of the Americas for selecting The Great Penguin Rescue for your book club this month. Thank you so much. And I really hope people enjoyed the book and thank you to Penguins International for sponsoring this as well. And so I am going to turn off my screen share so that um, I can take your questions. So thank you. Thank you so much, Diane. That was a great introduction to your book and to the amazing story of your work. I want to let everybody know who's joined us in the Zoom room that we are live streaming to Facebook. Uh, you are welcome to ask your questions in any way that you like. You can uh, put it in the chat box and I'll bring it to Diane. Or you can go live and if you want to go live, it's probably helpful if you put that in the chat box as well and then we'll call on you. So you can turn on your video at that point if you'd like to.
So everybody's saying thank you so much for all that you do for penguin conservation. Um, thanks to you, thanks to Penguins International for sponsoring this event tonight. Um, so so I want, I'm gonna get the questions started if I don't see any in the, in the chat box right away. And I wanted to see if you could just give us, I thought your descriptions throughout the book of penguin biology and ecology were just fascinating. And I wanted to know if you could give a, just a brief description of just some of the, you know, interesting characteristics of penguins. Um, so I would say, so from a biological standpoint, uh, the fact that they do have knees, which is the number one question, uh, they look like legless wonders, uh, but that's because they always keep their knees bent at a 90 degree angle. So they do in fact have knees and kneecaps. Um, they really are designed for life at sea. They spend 75 to 80% of their life at sea. And so their bodies are very streamlined, sort of like a torpedo or a football. Um, and they, some migrate thousands of miles every year. They, they, every species is different, um, but some will migrate like the Magellanic penguin, 3,000 miles up the coast of South America and back down again every year. Uh, so they all have sort of different characteristics and qualities, but they really are, um, they can dive deeper than any other bird on earth, hold their breath longer. The emperor penguin, which is the largest, stands almost four feet tall. The males can be 95 pounds. They can dive 1,800 feet and hold their breath for 32 minutes. Oh, wow. So pretty extraordinary for a bird, right? I mean, that's just incredible. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And, and really, you know, to me, they're very mammalian like I honestly, I've always been a mammal person. And so penguins sort of took me by surprise. I actually, when I went back to school, I wanted to work with dolphins and I did that briefly, but found my way to the penguins and they sort of captivated me because they, they really have these, these really big personalities. Uh, and each individual has a very unique personality as well. So um, yeah, they're just very charismatic seabirds. They are very charismatic and you're getting a lot of questions now too. So okay. I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna turn it over to the audience here. And so one of the first is from Maggie who asks, during the cleanup, did you go through any breeding or molting seasons? And how did it, did how did or did the oil spill affect those parts of a penguin's life cycle? And I know you had a good description in your book of the entire molt process of a penguin. And so maybe for those who don't know so much about penguins, you can briefly describe that molting process and what molt is and sure. then answer Maggie's question. Okay, and remind me if I forget it. But so I'll do the <laughs> molt part first and then her yeah. question, which you'll probably have to remind me about. So the molting, so all birds, you know, molt or replace feathers here and there, but penguins go through what's called a catastrophic molt. So this means they, they basically, they lose all of their feathers at once over a two to three week period. So they look like an exploding feather pillow when this is happening. And they're basically bald for a while. And the reason they do this is they rely so heavily on their feathers to keep them warm and dry in these cold ocean currents where they get all their food um, that you know, they, they just do it all at once to get it out of the way. So before the molt, they have to gorge themselves for several weeks. And some species like the little blues will literally double their body weight. So they'll go from two to three pounds to four to six pounds before the molt. And everything swells on their body. And then all these feathers come out and they grow in the new feathers. And then they can go back into the water once that molt is complete. And then the question was, did it disrupt, right? Exactly. Okay, I remember this. Um, so it's an excellent question. It, it was the middle of the breeding season, so it did disrupt dramatically that breeding season. And so what happened was the, the adults were removed, the oiled adults were removed from the island first, and then those clean adults from Dassin were removed. And the larger chicks um, were brought to different rescue centers. Some were at Salt River. There were about 750 of them there that were cared by two members of my team, um, uh, Stu Saro and Linda, du uh, yeah, Lauren Dubois. And, um, and so those birds, there were about 3,000 chicks that were hand reared and about 2,700 of them survived, which actually is a much better success rate than the parent birds can do. And so armed with that knowledge, this is one of those programs I mentioned at Sankob is their chick stirring program. So they now go out onto the islands every year since and rescue any abandoned chicks and hand raise them. And they have an 80% success rate doing that, which is better than the parents. So that was valuable knowledge that we gained from that. So what happened was the, for the following year or two, 
this is when I said they bred almost as successfully as never oiled penguins. Those are the two years I'm talking about. Uh, because what happened is because they all got separated from their mates, as I described in that section that I read from the book, they had to either find their old mates again once they were released back into the wild, or they had to find a new mate and kind of go through that ritual of, of figuring out how to breed with each other. Because oftentimes first time parents together as a pair, the first season, sometimes they're not as successful at it. So it took about two years, but then once they got over that little hump, they are breeding just as successfully as never oiled penguins again. Hmm. Wow, fascinating. And I, I had no idea that that molt was a catastrophic molt. That's incredible. Uh, we have from Melissa a question. What an amazing experience to be involved with the rescue. And she has a question about the penguin bites. <laughs> are they particularly prone to infection? And did you have to have medical treatment? And did that impact the rescue efforts? And I know in your book, you describe the Red Cross's involvement in the effort. So yes, yeah, so if you could share a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, the, the, there were, yeah, the bites are brutal. They bleed. And one of the things is if you were bitten, you were supposed to then go, you had to go get a tetanus shot because there's tetanus in the soil. And so and, you know, we were in this building that was filled with coal dust because the trains that, that were normally being repaired in there are coal transport trains. So there's dirt, there's guano, there's fish guts, there's human sweat, there's everything. I mean, it's such a dirty environment, really. And so if you were bitten, you had to go get a shot, a tetanus shot by the Red Cross. Um, I forget the second part of the question. Uh, let's see, she asked if it was prone to infection and um, did you, how did that impact rescue efforts? Oh, well, I don't know that it impacted it. I mean, there were people and I, there, there's this one section that I often read when I'm doing a presentation and everybody in the room goes, <gasps> um, and this happened more than once is, you know, even though we were training people how to safely handle these penguins and keep them away from their face as much as possible, um, every once in a while, you know, a head would get loose and they have these really long necks that are like snakes. It doesn't look like they have long necks, but they actually do have a very long S curve in their neck. And so they can reach out and strike you. And so several people got bitten on the face. In fact, a few people, including one of the researchers, got bitten clear through their lip. Wow. And so they had to go get stitches and get that all sewn up. Um, but this was one of the most remarkable things. I remember this one woman in my room, this young woman, that happened to her. She got bitten through her lip. I sent her off to the Red Cross to get stitched up and, you know, see ya, thank you. And I look up about an hour later and she is back in the pen feeding penguins like nothing <laughs> happened. And I literally just burst into tears. I'm like, you know, it was incredible the dedication of these volunteers to carry on despite incredibly punishing and awful conditions. Like they just, they were incredible. Yeah, definitely heroes of the story. Yeah. Uh, you have a question from Ruth. Did you do anything different with your penguin exhibit back in Boston after you returned? God, so far, I had a talk last week and somebody asked me that as well. And nobody has, has asked me that in 20 years. Um, I can't say we did do anything differently. I mean, we already had a very robust penguin breeding program. We were part of the SSP, which is a species survival plan, which makes recommendations for pairing for breeding to maintain the strongest genetic diversity in case we had to repopulate the wild someday. Um, and so, uh, uh, I can't say we, we did anything differently afterwards. I mean, we just, of course, incorporated this story into all of our educational programs. You know, this is a, this became sort of a, a keynote talk from our penguin exhibit so that to raise awareness, you know, about what's happening with these animals in the wild. Mm -hmm. I, and I think that's so important to understand. I know that you know, at times uh, people have different ideas about zoos and aquaria and, and having animals within them, but it just shows the real importance of zoos and how much they contribute to the conservation of species. So it's, yeah. it's true. And, you know, we would support the work of Sand Cub. I mean, we were, we sponsored them. And, and I mean, I think all of us, even those of us that do or did work in zoos and aquariums in an ideal world, all of the animals would be out in the wild. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, these animals are born there, someone's going to take care of them. And so those of us that work there love these animals so much and want to give them the best, healthiest possible life they can have. And we see them as ambassadors for their species so that we can educate people. I mean, I, my whole 
you know, I, I remember when the aquarium opened, I was eight years old and we went on a school trip and n I never dreamed, you know, that I would be back there 30 years later as staff, but it certainly for me was informative, you know, and, and kind of was like, wow, it was like this, this wow moment of seeing penguins for the first time in person. Oh, absolutely. A critical to the raising awareness. Mm -hmm. And um, Barbara is asking, what is the difference between the African penguins and the species that live in Antarctica? Oh, so there are 18 or 19 penguin species, depending who you talk to. Um, and so the African penguins live in a much warmer climate. They would never see snow where they are in South Africa. It's very hot there. Uh, and so they are smaller in body size. They have fewer feathers per square inch than say an emperor penguin in Antarctica would have. Uh, and so they are designed for a warmer climate. They actually have bare patches above their eyes. So I don't know if you remember that photo I showed of the oil penguin and it looked very red above the eye. And that's because it was really, um, it was hot and it was irritated from the oil, but that's actually a bare patch and that's called a heat window. So they can vent excess heat from their body. It's like when you run around as a kid in the summer and your cheeks get all hot and flushed, you know, you're venting heat from your body. And that's what those heat windows do. Well, penguins in Antarctica don't need heat windows. They don't have them. In fact, Adelie penguins in Antarctica have feathers that grow halfway down their beak to help warm that air that's going into their lungs. So each species has different adaptations to be able to live and thrive where it does. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah, I thought those bare patches were, were some impact from the, from the oil spill, but oh, that's fascinating. Yeah. I had no idea. I didn't know that. Um, so, oh, we got lots of questions for you. So, uh, Robert says, you, oh, and this struck me too, Robert. I just, I wanted to cry, actually, when I read this part of the book. Um, you said how silent the rescue center was at first. Um, did the penguins go back to being noisy after being scrubbed off? Now I'm going to cry. <laughs> Yeah. No, very. Yeah, they didn't. It, it and you know, this is a part that I sometimes cry when I read it as well. Um, and it always takes me by surprise 20 years later that that those emotions I'm feeling them right now can be so close to the surface. Um, but no, they didn't. They were really silent. I mean, for three weeks, I think I heard two little contact calls, which is sort of a fall, oh, you know, like a penguin looking for its mate. Uh, they were silent the whole time. Linda was there longer. She, she might be able to answer that question differently than I can, because I was only there for the first just under three weeks. So Linda, can you tell, um, did you ever hear them vocalizing? Because you were there, I think, the whole time, right? Uh, yes, I mean, it was almost three months. Um, but it, it is true, uh, walking into that huge building and, and having thousands of penguins, um, and it was the smell, not the sound that you noticed. <laughs> Um, but once they were decontaminated, once they went through the wash process and moved to the outside pens where there were pools, you did see more normal behavior. You did hear more calling. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so they, they were definitely, it was a whole different world. Uh, if you were there in the beginning uh, for the initial spill, yeah. it was uh, shocking, unbelievable uh, and you didn't know how it, the story was going to end. Mm -hmm. um, but seeing the people that came that only worked on the outside and seeing normal penguins, you know, pretty much feeding themselves and not being handled and just being herded into pools and out other than grading, which is a hands-on and, and grueling work is to check and see that they're fully waterproof before they were released. Um, those people had a different experience than the ones that were there in the beginning. So it, 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 it was two different worlds, the, the inside team and the outside team. That's fascinating because, you know, I never thought of it as the inside team and the outside team because I was there before they were moved outside. And, yeah. and I didn't realize how very different it, it was for, for those two groups of people. And it, it's just amazing that, you know, in emergency response, how fast things move, you know, uh, getting them in, building those resources, moving them through the process as fast as you can, and, and trying to figure out how we were going to wash enough penguins that we wouldn't be there for a year um, if we'd done it in our normal way. Um, mm -hmm. And so they did a, a shorter version of it, which required a longer time swimming it out, um, the, the, the soap area. The oil was gone, but the soap wasn't as is fully removed. So they, they had to swim it, swim it, swim it out. So that was a, a different procedure in order to move enough through fast enough uh, that we wouldn't be there for six to eight months. 
so two, two and a half months, uh, hopefully they were moved through in that time. Um, but once they were outside, um, the insides got torn down and it was just amazing how fast it happened. And then it ends as abruptly as it started and, and people who work it are suddenly, uh, you know, thrown out going, wow, I don't have to go to work every day and I don't have tens of thousands of penguins to handle. What do I do now? And so that recovery time for humans afterwards is, is a whole nother Another issue is that you've gone through something uh, totally immersive, mm. and one of a kind, and then how do you absorb that and, and come back from it? And, and it does change you. Yeah. Quite traumatic. I, I mean, I, you know, I can't imagine because you were there for the whole thing. And just within three weeks, I, I remember the first few weeks back at home. I mean, nobody can understand it that hasn't gone through it. it. You can't, there aren't words to describe it really. And I remember the first few weeks, um, two things. One was every morning as I was sort of in that waking state, I would, I would open my eyes and see my entire apartment filled to the ceiling, like wall to wall penguins. And I, my waking thought every day was like, oh crap, how am I gonna do this by myself? <laughs> and, and you know, and that lasted for a few weeks. And the other thing that lasted for a, even longer was going to work at the aquarium and feeling like this is pointless. Like nothing seemed as important as that had. Yeah, I mean, you have you have an incredible purpose, and you've got mm -hmm. a huge species at risk of of extinction in your hands. And so that, and then this team that is 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 cohesive and and working for a same goal. Um, and then you go back to normal life um, and what do you do then and so it, it there, there is leftover you know PTSD but um, how you absorb it and how you use that going forward is individual um, mm -hmm. but it is it happens so rapidly um, all the stages and, and it, uh, so everybody has a different response to it. Mm -hmm. Thank you for helping with that question. Linda. Oh yeah thank, thank you so much. We have a bunch more too, so okay. let's see what we can take now. Um, is there a record anywhere of all the AZA zoos and aquariums that helped with the rescue? Mm -hmm. uh, Mary is a former keeper with the Project Puffin, so thanks Mary for joining us, and now teaches college classes and uh, talks about your rescue in her classes. Oh my God. I was a keeper at the aquarium in Baltimore where I had my own puffins and I also worked with Project Puffins. So. Oh God, fantastic. Yeah. I'm so happy to hear that you teach this story. And yes, oh, I'm yeah. going gonna to leave my chair for two seconds to grab it because I was just looking at it today. Uh, there is this book, Spill, that was published by IFA the year after. It's very, very rare and hard to find because it was in South Africa. Right. Um, but in the back of this book, it has a list. There were 57, I think it is, 57 zoos and aquariums that they thank in the back of the book. Okay. Um, all of them are listed on this page. So I believe it was 57. Or, uh, one, of, one of the units that I teach when I'm teaching the history of zoos is zoos in, in um, ex situ, in situ, and why they, why I know the reasons why they matter. And I use that, the oil spill as, AZA sent, you know, penguin, the penguin tag and Steve Sarrow and all you guys all wicked. Um, and that that's such a critically important thing to have that expertise available to go in to corral all those volunteers you had. So it's, it's a, it is, it's an amazing, incredible story. I'm so happy you wrote a book about it, but, and I do, they watched, they watch your TED talk every semester. <laughs> oh, thank you, Mary. That's awesome. Thank you yeah. so much. Uh -huh. Thanks, Mary. And thanks for joining us again. It's good to see you. Um, I'm going to give away, uh, we have two books that are going to be given away tonight. Thank you for that too. Uh, so for the children's book, uh, Daisy did a drawing and it looks like uh, Sarah LePage won the children's book. And I'll announce the adult book giveaway <laughs> after Daisy's done another draw. So thank you, Sarah. Thank you. My kids are going to be so excited. Oh, awesome. <laughs> Congratulations. All right, Rebecca Rising uh, asked, it sounds like the rapid response was key to the, su the success of this penguin rescue. Are there organized groups that serve as wildlife first responders in these types of emergencies? That's a great question. Yes, so Linda was with IBRRC um, and her 
center now in Hawaii, I, well, that's local, but IBR is still operational. They are based in California and they are sort of the first responders for oiling events like this. And then IFA, uh, International Fund for Animal Welfare, they also do things like this. They were there, at least in South Africa, at our event, primarily it seemed in a logistical capacity, you know, sort of managing and organizing all of these organizations of people who had come to help. Um, but IBR, they are the ones like these people, they hit the ground running. They, they always have their vaccines up to date and their passports up to date and their, their, their suitcases packed. And as soon as they get the call, boom, they are on the next flight there. I mean, they, they are an incredible rapid response team. And I know there are other networks as well. Um, there are other de-oiling organizations that do this type of work as well. Mm -hmm. Good. I'm going to, I'm going to slip in a question because I, I love the youth component of this. Uh, we do a lot of mentoring of young people interested in the sciences and specifically wildlife and birds. Uh, so what happened to Dee, Dee? Where is she today? Do you know? You know, I almost, I had it and I removed it. So I'm like, I don't want to take too much time. And I had two slides in there um, of Dee, Dee and a big mic later because 60, so let me see, it was 16 years later. Uh, the International Penguin Conference was held in Cape Town that year. It's in a different city every three years. And so it was the first time we all sort of reconvened in Cape Town since the oil spill. And we had this big reunion and it was incredibly emotional. And I mean, I just cried on and off all week and I'm not a crier, but I was just, it was so moving to be with these people again, because as Linda was saying, like you, in rescue situations like this, disaster relief, you just instantly form the most intense bond with the people you're doing this with. And so Dee Dee was there and Big Mike was there and uh, more than half of our immediate team, those eight were there um, along with Estelle and some others. Uh, and so Dee Dee now is actually a hairdresser. Um, I've been in touch with her. I, I, you know, when I was writing the book, I was like, I need to reach out to people and, and interview them and get their stories because I was only there for the beginning. And I, and I guess I didn't speak with you know, people that were there at the end because Linda just told me some things I didn't actually know. Um, and so Facebook was a great tool for that. I was able to find people on Facebook and reconnect with them. So many of the people that I've talked about in the book, I, I have found either before or since the book came out. Um, and so, and then Big Mike, he still has his dojo, his, his jujitsu. He has champion, world champion students. And they come to America, they do competitions all over the world. Um, so he's still doing that um, 20 years later. Wow. Fantastic. Yeah, that's, that's just the human part of it. Um, I'll give out the another Daisy just did the drawing for the adult book, uh, The Great Penguin Rescue, and it goes to Judy Parrott Willis. So Judy, congratulations. You get a congratulations, book. Judy. Oh, so um, Jessica is asking, how soon after getting back from the rescue did you decide you wanted to write, publish a book about your experience? Oh, hi, Jessica. That's a good question. This was a no brainer for me. I, so from the, I started reading at age five and I was always a voracious reader. I would go to the library and get 10 books out every week. And, and from a very young age, I knew I wanted to write a book someday, but I just had no idea what it would ever be about. And I can remember the moment I was on the plane heading back to Boston from Cape Town after these three weeks in this, you know, up to my eyeballs and oiled penguins. And I can remember being about halfway across the Atlantic and all of a sudden going, oh my God, this is it. <laughs> this is my book. Like I couldn't not write it. I, I just remember thinking this is such a remarkable story. This is a story that has to be shared with the world. Luckily, Simon & Schuster's Free Press agreed. <laughs> And so, you know, it, it is out there and, and it's such a unique story. Um, you know, it's a one, like Linda said, it's sort of this once in a lifetime thing. Um, and it's, but it's also, it's more than just about the penguins and more about the, just the volunteers. It's sort of this story of hope and inspiration and, you know, what we can do when we come together and work as one. So it sort of has a, a lot of different elements to it. Um, but it really is my love story to the penguins and the volunteers who helped us save them. Well, it's such a, as I was talking to you before we started, it's just such a nicely written book. It's so informative and 
the biology interwoven with the rescue story is is fascinating. So it's a great job. Thank you. On Thank putting you this together, much. which I can't even imagine. Um, a number of people are asking about tonight's session. It is being recorded. It will be available on our uh, YouTube page with Environment for the Americas. Uh, it'll also be on Facebook Live if you go to our Facebook page, Environment for the Americas. We hope you'll follow us. Uh, so just to answer those before people start taking off. Um, Gail writes to you and says, I am a marine biologist who founded an environmental education uh, nonprofit, Earth Care, Earth Care dot online. I'm going to teach my Earth Care Eco Kids your amazing story. Thank you so much. So I just wanted oh. to, to, to share that with you. That's wonderful. Um, Thank you. And I'll have to check out your organization. Thank you. I wanted to, we always like to conclude, you gave uh, the prospects and the current population numbers of the African penguin, which I actually did a little bit of research beforehand. I was hopeful that it looks like over the years, there's been a pretty steep decline in the number of oil spills um, around the world. So I thought, ah, surely that'll be good for penguins. Um, so I'm, I'm a, I hope that in some ways that is, but we do know that the bigger, the bigger issues of climate change and food resources are affecting so many birds, including seabirds. Mm. So that is, is definitely uh, challenging to think about. Um, what, you know, what can you leave us with that we can do to help? How can people help? I'm, I'm glad you asked. So, you know, because the, the primary issues for penguins, most of the species, as I said, are global warming and overfishing, um, these actually are two things that each one of us has the power to do something about. So in terms of overfishing, you know, uh, I mean, Sylvia Earle says, just basically don't eat seafood at all or just eat tilapia, you know, and that's it. So you can decide, you know, change your diet or if you do eat fish to get the, there's a blue and white label that's sort of a safe seafood label that this is, you know, fish that we know doesn't have bycatch and things like that. So, um, and shrimp is probably, I love shrimp, but I, you know, I'm not gonna eat it anymore because it has so much bycatch. And there's so much food wasted and fish killed. So um, be mindful of what you eat. And then in terms of climate change, you know, be mindful of your habits, your daily habits to do everything you can to reduce your reliance on fossil fuels. You know, I've, I'm on my second Prius now. I love my hybrid car. Um, and, uh, you know, to vote as well, vote the issues. If you care about these things, if you care about the climate, you know, put the people into office who you know also care about these issues. Um, you know, just the little things in your home to turn down the heat and don't run the water and all these little things, they may sound, it's like that one drop in the ocean. It might sound like, oh, it's just, I'm one person, I'm doing this little thing, does it really make any difference? Well, if everybody did it, yes, <laughs> it does make a difference. So you can help, you can make a difference. And finally, if you wanna do something very specifically to help penguins, you can go to you know that, that page I showed you on my website, thepenguinlady.com to the help penguins page and to the donate section. And you can support Sandcob or any one of these other many rescue centers throughout the Southern hemisphere that work to take care and protect and save penguins. So um, that's a very specific thing you can do to help penguins as well. Yeah, and I love that quote that you put up. That's so true. And so anytime someone says, oh, what I do doesn't matter, just multiply it by 1 billion people, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Mary Gunther puts in the chat that uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium has that Project Seafood Watch, which is a great resource. And you can actually download their little card, which I've taken to restaurants with me so that you know what, you're, what kind of seafood you're buying and what's good for, you know, what's okay to purchase. Um, can you yes, just give a brief description of what bycatch is for those who might not know? Oh, okay. So bycatch. So when these fishing vessels go out and they, you know, they have these huge nets, these big trawlers, and there's all sorts of different types of fishing vessels, but, you know, they are just, they're just catching so much fish and they have this one target fish that they're trying to get but they're scooping up everything that's in the ocean with that one target fish. And so in a net, they might have 20% of that net might be the seafood they are looking for. And 80% of it is something they can't use. So they toss it back in the ocean, dead and dying. And so it's just this incredible waste and, and destruction of life, you know, for this little percentage of their target fish that they're trying to get. 
Um, and so that's the bycatch is all that extra fish that they're not using and throwing back into the ocean. And it usually is not going to survive that process. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that, for that description. So I know that people are at the end of their hour. I could talk to you all night. <laughs> um, but I know it's, uh, actually, I don't remember where you're calling in from. I'm in Boston area. Yeah, so it's actually getting late for you. It's fine. Um, there are any other questions. Melissa has another thought. A lot of bycatch also attracts seabirds, sea turtles, um, which are also terribly harmed from overfishing. So yes, yeah. I, I agree with you. I've also taken seafood out of my diet um, a long time ago. Mm -hmm. Diane, I want to thank you for your time, for your passion, for all that you've done for penguins. And I invite everyone, if you um, are interested in supporting, also to support Diane's work with the links that she um, put out. And we'll put those out again, too, on our Facebook page and elsewhere, and also to Penguins International. Um, I'm sure they take donations as well and, and use that to support penguin conservation. Thanks for sponsoring the program. Everyone's super happy, and Judy's uh, putting in a big wow thank you for the book which she just won and um, the love and the energy level that you all give to your conservation work thank, you, thank you thank you very much thank, thank you, you everybody thank you so tonight. well thank you so much for inviting me thank you for selecting my book uh, and I thank you all for your wonderful enthusiastic comments it's wonderful to see those so and thank you penguins international nice to meet you katie thank you for the work that you do we need to chat yes, yes. <laughs> yeah thank you so much great everyone i hope you have a good night and we appreciate the evening good night everybody thank you I just wanted to stop the live stream. So that's not going anymore. All right. And that's amazing. Uh, I just can't imagine. I, it's just like post, I, I heard her say post-traumatic stress syndrome. I just, yeah. I just can't imagine. I, I, I would definitely do it in a heartbeat, but I know I'd probably be an emotional wreck. <laughs> Yeah. You, it, it, it was, there definitely was PTSD and they warned us about that too when we were leaving. They, oh, did they? they? Yeah, they did. And you know, there had been that robbery too. So they had brought in counselors um, after that robbery because that was very traumatizing. Um, I actually just missed that by minutes, but, um, and they did, so they brought in counselors for that. And then at the end, when, when we were leaving, they said, yeah, you can expect, you know, you'll have some mild PTSD from this. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was good to have that warning, you know, to realize when I was, those weird things were happening, that that was normal response to, to that situation. Yeah. Yeah. Did they ha offer any counseling or anything? <laughs> did they recommend? <laughs> there, there wasn't any post care. No. I mean, you know, for those people that I think they had maybe one or two counseling sessions at that point, I had actually just been moved over to San Cobb. Um, uh -huh. And, and they all were still over at Salt River. And so that's where the counseling took place. Cause they, once that robbery happened at the hotel, they moved everybody to a new hotel, except for me and one other guy, cause we were now over at San Cobb. So I had to stay in that same hotel where this robbery had just taken place at gunpoint and machete point. Um, so I was a little nervous about that. Yeah. Uh, so, but no, there was no like aftercare. No, I can't say. Yeah. 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 yeah I think I'd have to go for that maybe. <laughs> I mean, and you did, like you said, you know, you, it, anybody who loves animals is going to be traumatized by walking into that rescue center with 16,000 oil penguins in it, but you just had to push down your emotions yeah. and literally had to sort of put a lid on it because if you thought about it and if you thought about what these penguins are going through, you'd fall apart. You would not be able to function. And so you had to compartmentalize you know, and really just sort of like, okay, I'm just going to tamp these emotions down for now. I'll deal with that later. Right. right now, I just have to do the work in front of me. Exactly. And yeah, you just couldn't, you couldn't allow yourself to feel it because you wouldn't have been able to function. Great. Yeah, yeah. I can't imagine. And you said you were so tired at night, you would just fall asleep and wake up in your clothes and, you know. <laughs> have you ever had um, surgery? Have you ever had anesthesia? Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what it felt like every night. Oh, really? Yes. I'm not, I mean, it literally felt like anesthesia. I, I, it, I, it was unbelievable. Like you would literally close your eyes and the next second it was morning and you're like, 
wait a minute, I haven't slept yet. I honestly, like that first morning, I'm like, I didn't sleep. Why are you waking me up? Like, why are you knocking on my door? I haven't gone to sleep yet. And every night was like that. And I'm sure just all the stress and emotion. Yeah. 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 Well, just the physical exhaustion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Somebody's, oh, see, okay. Somebody's asking a question. Oh, I accidentally popped up. A, 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 the book club has just been so much fun. I've gotten to meet people whose books I've read, whose work I've known. Project Puffin was on and uh, Steve Kress came and talked about his work. And that's a, a project I've seen for a long time. So that was fun. Yeah, yeah you guys want to put on your cameras and chat. We can just keep it open for those. Who just it was wanna... me because I know Steve really, really well. The project yeah. Puffin. I'm like, wait, that was Steve. Where did he go? And so like, <laughs> yeah. There's not very many people left on. So I thought, let me ask her. Like, what? Yeah. Is she going to come talk? But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, I'm all yeah. There I am, just penguins. But seabirds are awesome. And well, and everybody can well, use this. The entire planet. So, you know, it's. it's <laughs> Right. <laughs> I kind of like, wait, that was B. Where'd he go? So, <laughs> so I thought I'd ask. Yeah, you were too fast. You caught that. I thought I got it off fast enough. <laughs> yeah, well, I picture. I, you know, I've taken pictures just like that one. And so, uh -oh. yeah. I've a very, very long time. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, this was great. I'm going to go now because I, I have to go to grade papers. Um, but, <laughs> Diane, this is fabulous. It's nice to meet you actually in person because I know your voice really well from the TED talk and also having been a zoo I was at the National Aquarium in Baltimore when all this happened and I'm a puffin person um, and so I couldn't get permission to go to South Africa oh. but, um, because that's just those but um, so I'm very very aware of what happened I talk about this in environmental science. I actually teach a course I designed on the history of zoos at Salisbury University in Maryland oh, and one of the things we do is how zoos impact the wild and what do zoos do and so that's one of the examples and I, they watched the whole TED talk and said look this is when this happened these are the people they called and they went and and they're you know I've known Steve Saro for years um, and I know a lot of Steve people for years but now we're all older <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. I was in a, uh, like, I'm not really quite sure how well I would do standing on my feet. I'm 63 now, so it might be a little harder to like go do that, but I still would. I yeah. do it too. New people are awesome and they're amazing and they're absolutely incredible. And I still, I believe that was all my heart. I'm still a card carrying member of AZA. Um, I tend to go to education stuff when I go now. I just developed a course um, with Sarah Walker on wildlife trafficking that I'll be teaching and stuff. And so I, just, I wanted to, to see this and it was nice to meet you guys. And I also do all kinds of migratory bird day stuff. So. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> so this is, this is really, really nice. And so keep, keep doing what you're doing. And um, I will probably now use your website up in my class. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Mary. And stuff. So this was really wonderful. So, so good night, you guys. And, and thanks, thanks, Mary. It was great to meet you. Yeah. yeah thanks thank for you. joining us. Hi, Jessica. Hi, Diane. We finally Hello. actually need to speak. <laughs> I know, exactly. We've been only speaking on social media. I just wanted to say thank you. I, I read your book so long ago that it was a nice memory of everything. So oh, thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Jessica wrote a, 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 a review, a lovely review for my new book. So thank you very much. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, I know. I was very excited to read it and, and get it and, and eventually review it. So awesome. Thank, Thank you. you so much. I really appreciate it. Yeah, we've been chatting for several years now on Facebook. Oh, really? That's fun. We have. Yeah, because yeah, when I used to live on the East Coast, <laughs> we were about to meet, but then I happened to move back to the Midwest. So you know, yeah, it has, been oh a, it has been a long time. It was because I read your book. <laughs> oh my gosh. I, okay. I didn't even remember. Hi, Peggy. Hi. Yep. Look at my last well, well awesome. I'm All right, nice to see you. Nice to actually hear your voice. <laughs> Excuse me. I didn't mean to jump. I'm Susan's uh, hearing <laughs> squad. Welcome to see you too. Thank person. you. Have a good night. <laughs> Y'all are wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thanks, Diane. Thank what? What's that? No, Peggy said she was Susan something, and I didn't catch my what she said. She's my cousin. Oh, your cousin. Oh, how nice. <laughs> I'm, her, oh, I'm, nice I'm her cheerleader. Yay, your Susan. cheerleader. Yay. <laughs> it's nice to have family who are cheerleaders, for sure. Yes, it is. Yeah, I grew up yeah. in Alabama, so being into wildlife was a little unusual when I was growing up. Oh, you don't sound like you're from Alabama. 
No, I went to graduate school in Michigan and they gave me such a hard time. I got rid of the accent. <laughs> but when I talk to Peggy and the rest of the family, it comes right back. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> yeah. 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 Can we have a y'all? <laughs> yeah. There you go. And thanks so much. I sure appreciate it. You've given quite a bit of your time tonight. So my pleasure. I don't want to keep you too much longer, but uh, thank you. For well, all that thank you. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate the invitation. I appreciate you selecting the book and I'm so glad you enjoyed it. And, uh, and this was really fun. So thank you so much for having me. Yes. We'll look forward to hopefully talking to you again. I hope so. All right. Take, Take care. care. Bye. Bye.